All right, about to get started here. Oh, yeah. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Just making sure we're all set. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Okay. Doing the classic. Can you all hear me okay? Just want to make sure audio's audio's feeling good across the board. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks for everybody in the chat. That's super helpful just uh, for your feedback there. Really, really great. Okay, cool. Um, okay, yeah. Everybody, thank you so much for being here. Good morning and Welcome to the open guest lecture today with UltraLeap CTO and co-founder Tom Carter as part of our Hand Interactions Pro event series. I'm Joe Gabriel here uh, calling in from Seattle, Washington uh, as part of the XR Bootcamp team. And I'm just really grateful to have you here, have Tom and the UltraLeap folks here, uh, and then everyone around the world. It was really cool to see uh, all of you know where you're calling in from at crazy different times of the day. So just very much uh, thank you so much from, from the XR Bootcamp team. Quick introduction before we get started in the open guest lecture. Uh, I wanna introduce a little bit about what we're doing with the Hand Interactions Pro Event Series uh, for you, the developers, uh, for the folks that are uh, nearest and dearest to our hearts and, and that are deepest in the dungeons of advanced hand interaction development, right? Um, so what we have coming up uh, for all of these events, you're able to go to xrbootcamp.eventbrite.com uh, to register for all of these, get all the event details and to get the calendar invites to make sure to get that in your calendar. So what we have today is the deep dive with Tom. So we're gonna be specifically talking about the business uh, and future of hand interaction technology. And what's really great, uh, I have a little fun story about Tom. So 2016, 2017, I was working at The Void uh, based in Utah, uh, a location-based entertainment VR uh, company, right? And we had this young, impressive team called Ultra Haptics that was coming in for a demo. And I got to host this team. And it was really great. They brought a little, uh, they brought a little demo kit with them, a little sensor array. It was like this big, you know, maybe this, this, high, this high. And they plugged it into a MacBook. And they said, okay, this is ultrasound technology and you're gonna feel it. And I didn't really know what they meant by like ultrasound technology in that you're gonna feel it. All I knew is that you used ultrasound for, uh, for seeing babies uh, before they were born. Okay, so let's see what this is gonna do. Uh, they turn on this demo and all of a sudden I feel these invisible little bubbles rising up and popping against my hand. Uh, and this was mind blowing. Uh, they had a little visual on the laptop where you could see the bubbles coming up that helped a little bit with the conceptualization. And then also able to pass my hand through an invisible waterfall. And it was just mind blowing to see, you know, what Ultra Haptics at the time was able to do uh, with this piece of technology for immersive experiences. And it's been really, really cool seeing the Ultra Haptics team evolve from then to what Ultra Leap is now and seeing Tom and his team continue to grow and uh, be able to be such an awesome kind of industry player on the software and hardware side, as well as immersive content and uh, more practical applications for, for some of this technology. So really excited to have Tom here with us today. Um, this next Thursday, we have the rest of uh, the Ultra Leap Squad uh, meeting with us and on a follow-up open lecture. Chris, Hannah, and John will be meeting with us more for like a technical deep dive, uh, specific industry use cases. So uh, developers that are here today, please come check out again next Thursday uh, for part two uh, for a little more of that technical in, uh, deep dive that you will be interested in. This Saturday, if there's only two things you walk away with today, the first thing is uh, take all of those nuggets of information from, from Tom that he'll be giving out. And then number two is that this upcoming workshop this Saturday is a killer opportunity uh, for all of you hand interaction and uh, hand input developers. It is the state of the art hand tracking and interaction design workshop. Uh, the lead instructors will be Roger Kung and Dennis Kuner. These are the co-founders of Holonautic and creators behind the hand physics lab. Um, specifically in this workshop, uh, you'll be going through uh, interaction design, hand tracking, physics, locomotion, neuroscience, kinematics, um, and really this workshop's designed to help save you, uh, the developers, hundreds of hours of what you would normally spend 
prototyping time, right? Um, there's going to be a bring your own project section. So if you have a client-based project or a personal project that's using hand tracking or hand interactions of any kind, uh, you can bring this during the segment and share it with Dennis and Roger, get kind of professional feedback, insights. They can help help you with any troubleshooting or if you're just not sure what to do or just looking for uh, you know, a, an expert level you know, set of eyes to come look at your project and make sure that it's meeting the needs. Uh, this is the time to bring that project. Uh, you're going to learn things about how the human brain perceives reality, proprioception, uh, developing a sp spatial computing mindset, very different from just other, you know, 2D development aspects or even, uh, you know, 3D games, just spatial computing and immersive uh, design. What does that look like? Uh, kinematics and physics-based interactions, uh, essential interface design principles um, across different product stages. What's that look like for your project? And then helpful design perspectives to build a fully functional and responsive interface. So that's what you can expect from this workshop this uh, this upcoming Saturday. Uh, this is you can get all the details at xrbootcamp.eventbrite.com. And for everyone on the call today, uh, you can get your twenty percent discount code. Uh, we wanted to share with you xrbootcamp twenty. Uh, but you got to take action on that here pretty quick. Uh, it's only valid till four p.m. Eastern today. Uh, so want to get that across your board. Um, as a super important opportunity. And last but not least, XR Bootcamp, we're launching our uh, Advanced Hand Tracking and Interaction Design Masterclass. This is a advanced uh, professional development training course, eight weeks long, really just an awesome deep dive, again, with Roger and uh, Dennis, um, who will be teaching this Saturday's workshop. They will be the lead instructors across this eight-week period where you and your uh, team members uh, will be really diving deep uh, into creating amazing hand tracking and interaction design prototypes. And uh, XR Bootcamp will also be including a Quest 2 as part of your learning resources. Um, and so just real quick reminder, all the details that you just heard uh, are at xrbootcamp.eventbrite.com. Um, we want all your questions in the chat. Uh, please hang around and just uh, feel free to ask us anything. Uh, let us know what you'd like to learn from Tom. Uh, uh, and we'll be sure to share any of that. Again, grateful to have all of you and ready to turn the time over now to uh, Tom with Ultra Leap. And thanks everybody for being here today. Hi everyone. Uh, this is Farhan from XR Bootcamp. I would like to also, as Joe mentioned, I would like to introduce Tom. So we will have uh, some kind of like a fireside chat. So the questions, will um, actually uh, flood today. Make sure that we ask everything in our mind in terms of uh, Ultra Leap strategy and what is the hand tracking um, future looks like for Ultra Leap and for the industry. So hi, Tom, I'd like to thank to you on behalf of the audience. We have today um, over 100 uh, people watching us. Uh, and uh, VRARA with the support of VRARA and our bootcamp, hand tracking bootcamp. And I'd like to ask to you, how are you? How is everything on your side? Yeah, hi everybody and uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, things are good on this side and, uh, and I'm really looking forward to the event. Perfect, perfect. So I would like to use this opportunity maybe uh, for 20, 25 minutes, uh, we will discuss for uh, several topics, but after that I would like to open uh, the floor and the, the stage to everyone attending to us, to our event, and make sure that they are actually asking the questions to, to you directly. So uh, we can even, um, possible that we can even uh, bring the people directly talk with us in a, with a video and audio. This is also possible in addition to chat questions. So there is a Q&A um, section for those who are attending that you can start throwing your questions. Uh, I will be looking at this. On the other side, you can also raise hand if you'd like to really uh, be part of the discussion. I, I will actually uh, invite our, um, our uh, trainers and maybe some of our alumni to the discussion. So I hope that everyone will enjoy today. So without further ado, let's start with the recent announcements. It was quite exciting whenever we hear it was all of a sudden, we know Qualcomm, we know Ultra Leap, 
uh, we know ultra haptics and leap motion and uh, we know how you much contributed for the last four or five years to the industry but this was actually one of the um, major moves that we have seen from two big industry players can you explain to us um, what does the Qualcomm partnership means with Ultraleap? Yeah, absolutely. It's a super exciting point for us to reach. Um, what the partnership means is that Ultraleap's hand tracking technology will be pre-integrated and optimized on Qualcomm's XR2 chip. So the XR2 chip is um, what we expect will power the majority of the next generation of, uh, of headsets. And our hand tracking technology will be there if any of the uh, if, if the OEMs, the people creating the headsets, want to use it. So pre-integrated and optimized to run the XR2. Um, really, I think this is uh, super exciting because we have uh, a lot of great developers building great content with our technology, which we really, really love. Um, and I think this is going to be a, a a real pivot point where that work suddenly has a much wider audience as the hand tracking start to be a, a default that ship with uh, consumer and enterprise headsets. So yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be super exciting. Perfect. So um, a little bit more in detail, for example, in terms of when you look at the hardware manufacturers, um, right now headset manufacturers, um, what kind of accessibility and affordability um, opportunities waiting for us because all of the major players here working all of us working for the adoption right the mass adoption that we are waiting for the maybe a few years and we are hoping that it will happen um, soon uh, both on enterprise and consumer level so what does it mean from the accessibility standpoint and uh, affordability standpoint um, how and a hand tracking enabled headset can achieve mass adoption. Is it, are you believing that this is something that uh, can help, especially for non tech savvy um, users, consumers that can much better adapt VR, AR? Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, a, a key aspect of building a headset um, is to, to understand its cost and every feature that you add. The, the, the companies creating the headset will look at how much does it cost to add this feature, to add this functionality, what's the trade-off and what's the value there. And what we're doing with the integration onto the XR2 is that our hand tracking is available on the, the standard reference design that Qualcomm provide. So if you are a manufacturer of a headset, you pick up the XR2, you can get the reference design from Qualcomm. It includes uh, two cameras on the front of the headset um, uh, and sort of uh, linked into the to, to the chip and the system, and the cameras do both the uh, the six off tracking, so the, uh, the the head tracking that tracks your, your movements as you move your head um, while looking into the room, um, and also the uh, the hand tracking. So, realistically, if you're going to make a standalone headset that's going to have six off tracking, um, there's no additional hardware cost to uh, to add hand tracking to these headsets now, which is a big change because previously. Um, uh, in a lot of cases, maybe you needed to add additional cameras, you need to add additional hardware or illumination. Um, every little bit of cost just adds that that hurdle of um, will they add it or will they not. So I think that's really changed the barrier, and you'll, and you'll see um, much much higher adoption of hand tracking in uh, in the next generation of headsets. And then I think um, kind of more than that, if I, I genuinely believe that in order for um, um, XR to, to, to scale and to, and to get that massive option that we're all looking for, it's got to be really, really simple to use. It's got to be really, really low friction. Uh, it's kind of the phrase that I've had since um, since way before starting the company doing my PhD is, uh, is, is low friction. So um, it's got to be easy to dip in and out of the experience. It's got to be uh, simple to, for people to just walk up and use. Um, and putting the headset on uh, is, is one thing. Having to have two other controllers that you've got to charge and pair and, uh, and have with you increases that friction. So I think this um, increased adoption of having hand tracking available on the headsets will help with the acceleration and adoption of XR um, because you start getting products that are just way easier to use, way easier for the consumer to just slip them on the head and dive straight into the experience. Um, and 
uh, part of that I was really excited to see. I think um, Hiram, one of the, direct, the director of product management at Qualcomm, uh, the way he describes it is uh, hand tracking is now table stakes for, um, for, for VR headsets. So if you're making a headset, if you just want to be at the table, you've got to have hand tracking now. Um, so I think that's a big, uh, a, a big shift. Perfect. So when we look at the um, coordination between the manufacturers, of course, there needs to be a coordination on the uh, headset manufacturer side and your support to them with the help of Qualcomm. And on the other side, there is, uh, of course, like the software part of it that probably uh, here we have uh, lots of developers today. So they may want to see it might be a great opportunity for them to deploy their hand tracking enabled um, experiences or apps in multiple platforms, right? So when you look at from this perspective, maybe considering OpenXR, um, is, will it be easier to deploy hand tracking to different devices? So uh, maybe you can give some um, insights to us before, because it will definitely increase the encouragement or the, the motivation of developers. Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, it, it's one thing to say, uh, Ultra Leap's hand tracking will be on a much wider range of devices and headsets by uh, by default. That in itself makes it uh, easier to build content and have it work on a, a, a large range of devices. Um, so that's exciting. But more than that, also, um, as you mentioned uh, there, OpenXR is a big factor here. Um, I think um, so OpenXR is the, the, like the open standard for accessing VR, AR platforms and devices. Um, and I think getting to OpenXR v1.0, which happened very recently, is, is a massive tipping point because you always have that, that, that chicken and egg um, uh, situation of people will buy the hardware when there's the content and people will make the content when people are buying the hardware. So breaking that, that, that cycle is, uh, is, is key to the success of any new uh, technology industry that has the sort of like hardware software um, pairing. And um, I think what's better for the, for the whole industry is that we don't see silos or ecosystems building up, but these kind of open standards that allow developers and creators to build content that will run on any, uh, any device, any platform. So, um, and, and I think there's, there's, there have been silos up till now, but that's not necessarily been because the different companies don't want to play together. It's just that there hasn't been this standard, this sort of forum to bring everybody together. So now OpenXR uh, exists. We're part of it. We support it. We've released um, a, a beta version of our uh, hand tracking that supports OpenXR. So then if you build any application that supports uh, OpenXR, um, it will run on any headset uh, that supports OpenXR. So that's, uh, that, that's really exciting as well. Yeah, it's very exciting. And good news for us, I, I really believe that a, think of every every headset has its own dynamics and uh, different limits. Uh, making it in a much more standard platform will be um, will be a really uh, um, best for the developers, so they can reach more uh, wider audience. So, um, in terms of your new device that you announced, maybe uh, we can go a little bit further to that. Of mm -hmm. course, we know the previous uh, device and hardware from Leap Motion, Ultra Haptics. What should we expect from this device? Because I know at least like a few people uh, just uh, received their uh, device, but um, we haven't tried yet. None of us tried yet. So what should we expect from this device? And when you look at the software side, how we are merging the, um, let's say the, the, the knowledge and research uh, that you have done on leap motion and ultra haptics in one device. I'd like to understand better because I think the merge of leap motion and ultra haptics is playing an important role. Maybe it's the first baby from this merge. We can say that, right? Uh, yes, it's the first. It's the first product launch. I guess it's sort of harder product launch we've done since um, since since the merge. That's true. Um, the uh, the product I think you're talking about is our. Um, new camera module that we've launched. So this is actually um, purely for the hand tracking. Uh, it's not quite kind of like a, a, a haptics tracking combo yet, um, like our um, haptics development kits are. So um, this has been a really interesting one, launching this, this camera module, because it is, 
it is in many ways the next generation um, camera hardware to the leap motion controller that um, many, many people bought and, and, and created a, a lot of amazing stuff on. Um, the big difference between the leap motion controller and the, uh, the new camera module that we've launched is the new one is really targeted for integration. So it's designed for integration into headsets. So it's not uh, kind of like a consumer finished product that's CE certified and, uh, and kind of like water resistant and these kind of things. It's a, um, it is an evaluation kit. Uh, it is somewhat delicate compared to the uh, metal edge device that you can throw around. Um, but we wanted to make it available because we know a lot of people are going to build um, really awesome experiences with it. So uh, I'm not going to say we're not slightly nervous that people are going to um, grab it and uh, uh, roughhouse it a little bit, but um, that's what it is. So in terms of the actual difference for the, uh, the camera and what we're bringing there, it has a much wider field of view. Um, long, it can track hands over a, a longer distance. It's got a slimmer form factor. It uses less power consumption. And the whole thing is really designed to be uh, easy to integrate into headsets. So I think um, uh, the uh, it's, it's already in Vario's headsets, uh, VR engineers, Pimax, uh, and then um, Dreamcrafts, Twilight Saga, um, like uh, installations and exhibition that they've got. Um, and yeah, it's super exciting. The the, the difference that those um, that those spec bring makes a big difference to the hand tracking. So range is nice, but also that, that field of view is, is kind of the key. So the, the lead motion controller has field of view of 140 by 120. Um, this breaking, bringing that up to 170 by 170, particularly for VR, what that means is when you have the, uh, the, the device integrated into your headset or attached to the front, really kind of anywhere you put your hands, it's going to be able to, to, to track them. Um, the range is longer than your arms. You can move your arms around in front of you and, and it's going to track your hands wherever they go. It's a really cool experience sitting down and putting your hands on your lap uh, and still seeing them track while they're sort of sat on your knees while you're, uh, you're looking up and forward. So, um, and uh, there are a few people who've got hold of them uh, already and I've seen some uh, responses and feedback coming back on Twitter, which is super exciting. Uh, and I think it does it does have that wow effect when you combine all those software and, the, uh, and that module scene. Um, one person chatted easily the best they've ever tried. Uh, and so, yeah, we're, we're excited to see that um, appear in more headsets and people get hold of it and, uh, and see what they can see what they can build, see what they can create with that bigger, bigger field of view. Perfect. So some of us have already leap motion. We also as a, as a VR first and XR bootcamp, we distributed leap motion to many um, universities, to um, many uh, hubs, developer hubs. So um, if we have leap motion, you still suggest us to get this new device? Uh, I think it depends what you want to do. Um, if you want something that's really robust and you can uh, develop with it, and if you're gonna put it in sort of installations in, um art galleries or museums that a lot of people create amazing sort of artistic immersive experiences then i'd say go with the the leap motion controller um it's sort of uh, designed to be a standalone um, module if you are somebody who's looking at building a new headset uh, or hacking some kind of new hardware product and you actually want to build our camera uh, into that product um go get the uh the um sar 170 the new the new module um, it's actually sort of a key point that if, if you wanted to build a hardware product before, you couldn't buy a camera module because you couldn't buy a leap motion controller without the case that was suitable for, uh, for integration. And then if you just want to experiment with that big ass field of view and, uh, and, and create new exciting experiences, then yeah, go ahead, grab it and, uh, and, and give, it a, give it a whirl. Perfect. Uh, there is one question regarding, I mean, I will, I will go back to the questions, by the way, please continue uh, submitting your questions. Uh, I'm asking to the all the audience here, but uh, please uh, submit through Q&A button, not directly from the chat, because it will be easier for us to make sure that every question being answered or taken care of. So um, one question, Tom, uh, about accessibility, since we are already talking, I want to also, um, I also want to mention about the um, uh, use cases, but let's start from the accessibility use case. 
what are the things that you have seen so far ultra haptics leap motion and this new uh, device um what kind of special accessibility um, use case that you have seen so far which is really actually helping us that we cannot enable in a mobile phone or in any other medium um yeah really interesting question so um probably one of the coolest um uh applications that i've seen that just just kind of make you happy um is um there's a a, a company called vivid vision who's created this um this vr experience it has our hand tracking in it uh, and it's essentially a game which trains you to uh to to, to improve um the condition of having a lazy eye so uh, it gives you two different images one to each eye and it changes the the intensity or the brightness of the of those images or the clarity and then gets you to play this game and uh, and helps train your, your your body and your brain to use both eyes equally and sort of strengthen up the uh, the, the weaker one so um that always resonated with me because i think it's really cool to see these kind of applications that like you say yeah you couldn't do that with a smartphone or anything else and it's not just a, a cool exciting game it's you know it's generally making somebody's uh somebody's life better and, and, and helping them out so um those are really exciting um outside of that just sort of other uh, other types of applications we see a lot for um training and simulation um which is probably something that's not so visible it's not so uh it doesn't really get the sort of the clicks on the articles but um it's kind of really what vario um uh, they, they create high-end headsets targeted at training and simulation they have our hand tracking in um and they're used in all sorts of applications including like the automotive design process that's actually used in the creation of new uh new cars new new vehicles and the key with hand tracking there really is um if you are training or learning to perform some kind of function then rather than clicking a button in a general direction you're actually starting to build that muscle memory you're actually flicking the switch or pressing the button rather than just kind of waving a controller in the in, in the right area and also something i didn't really consider at the beginning is a lot of these a lot of sort of training centers they they have pretty high throughput uh, they need to get a lot of people in and out uh, and just having a tethered headset that you pull down and put on your head no controllers to tether, charge, lose, sort of end up mixed up, um, just just makes a massive difference on on throughput and how fast you can uh, you, you can put people through. Um, yeah, there's also entertainment applications which I which I think are more visible. Um, uh, of course, uh, the Void um, has our uh, uh, has our hand tracking and all of their um, uh, their exhibits. And those are really cool that sort of really for making you feel part of the experience and uh and I, and I think really um hand tracking can add a lot to that sort of social interaction if you've got multiple people in an experience uh, avatars are great being able to actually have your hands and just the little hand signals that you do we're so trained and kind of evolved as humans to pick up on these little details the sort of little summons or little hand signals to make people pay attention or or, or, or um such like as they're communicating are really important um so yeah those are great um and then one actually i'd, I'd probably mention it's, it's outside of um outside of vr so if i can just jump out of, out of vr for a second um something's happened uh or really taken off recently which i'm really excited about is um making public touch screens touchless so naturally we're all doing this via zoom largely because uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic and there's a virus spreading around and we're doing a lot of work to take public touch screens, the things in um, transit terminals for buying your tickets, in uh, immigration for uh, processing in fast food restaurants for ordering your food. Those screens are a massive uh, like transfer location for pathogens. You know, everybody's touching them and they never get cleaned. And we're taking those, adding a camera in our software, and now it becomes touchless and you can interact with it. Taking a lot of the controls and how to you know, select options that we've learned from applications in the VR uh, space uh, and applying it to something that's uh, uh, not quite as immersive, not quite as exciting or fun, but um, uh, hopefully providing people with a safe, hygienic way of interacting with these systems, um, which feels pretty good. So. Um, one thing that um, maybe I know that uh, we have a special session next week on Thursday on that, but about this autonomous vehicle uh, use case, um, 
maybe you can a little bit mention about that and any other enterprise application that stand stand out uh, because we know that especially in our master classes we we see that there is a huge interest from enterprise as well as game um, industry so happy to hear a few more use cases maybe from there yeah absolutely so we do um we do a lot of work with the automotive industry and i phrase that into two parts um there's what we call the front of the car and the back of the car so the front of the car is kind of vehicles today uh, where a human is driving them and uh, the main focus there is enabling you to control the infotainment system of the car change the climate control change your music and um, answer a phone call without having to take your eyes off the road so you can hold your hands out the real key there is we can track what your hands are doing and we can provide that tactile feedback that haptics through the air directly onto your hands so the effect of that is you don't have to find the controls, the controls can find your hands and you can press them, you can feel them. And the results are that uh, I think we get um, about 20% reduction in driver uh, mental load and they make less glances away from the road, they spend less time with their eyes off the road, so it's improving driver safety. Um, and that's that key that you can track the hand and feel it. And then the back of the vehicle looks slightly further into the future and um, we're, we're really looking at autonomous vehicles. So once um once you don't own your own car uh likely you sort of uh continue the uber model where if you want to go anywhere you press a button an autonomous vehicle turns up you jump in it uh, and then it takes you to where you want to go how are you going to interact with the vehicle while you're in there um and there's a there's sort of a combo of factors there one actually goes back to the hygiene factor again um if that vehicle's taking a few uh, thousand people or so on journeys that week do you really want to be touching all the touch screens and pressing all the buttons? Probably not. Um, so having a touchless interface that you can still feel is really important. But then also there's the, what are the experiences going to be in the vehicle? Um, I'm afraid the, uh, the way the model is going to work is that um, the companies that operate the fleets will compete on price, uh, which means your, uh, your rides will be as cheap as possible. Um, but then they will look to monetize people once they're in the vehicle. So how can you uh, whether you can enable people to do their shopping there, sort of tie ins with um, companies that will deliver things for you or, or, or such like. And the um, the example you mentioned there, this um, what we call backseat driver uh, demonstrator, was a VR experience that we created, which transports you into uh, one of these autonomous vehicles um, and enables you to do um, to do shopping, to browse social media, browse the web, watch videos, and of course, because it's all um, uh, VR or soon to be AR, you can just make the screens as big as you want, position them wherever you want. We have really cool um, like interaction mechanisms for um, grabbing um, inter uh, interactive elements that you're going to work on and throwing them into the uh, into the space in front of you. Um, and then a cool um, uh, sort of wellness or well-being uh, experience as well. So can you use the haptics and the hand tracking to relax people and to calm them down and make it a a pleasant environment to be when you're stuck in traffic. So, um, yeah, it was a really cool experience. Uh, it's got a lot of great um, feedback, and it kind of ties in a lot of what we're seeing behind the scenes in the uh, in the automotive sector and some of the work that we're doing there. In a way, we can show up publicly. Uh, and um, yeah, one of our, uh, I think actually Hannah's going to talk about that next week, uh, and a lot of the user testing and how they built that into a, an experience that people really enjoy. Perfect, perfect. Uh, we have uh, almost 12 questions right now, so uh, I will really leave the uh, time for these questions because there are very interesting questions, a little bit challenging questions, I should warn you beforehand. <laughs> so uh, at least in terms of the your your positioning in the industry. Um, one last thing that I would like to ask, especially for enterprise again, have you um, measured the ROI, like the an enterprise application with controllers or another input method versus hand tracking. Do you have, I have, I think I remember that I have read a few uh, blog posts about that, but can you share with us like what kind of ROI that we should expect in terms of development costs or in terms of even the user experience and even like the, 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 the um, impact of the experience for the use case? Yeah, we've done it for a bunch of different applications, um, particularly for, um, which it, we had a great study commissioned for automotive comparing the uh, the ROI of 
mid-air hand interactions versus touch screens and the and, and the differential that that makes on um uh on uh your experience as a driver uh and we've done it in a in some entertainment settings as well um i can't say that we've uh that we have public figures anyway that we've shared for the comparison between controllers and hand tracking for um enterprise vr applications partially because they're so varied like it, that, that is a, that's a challenging thing to measure i think um but yeah we haven't published anything yet on that okay um okay then let's let's start the q a session uh what i will do is uh, our team will actually now add um our instructors mentors and alumni of the hand tracking so we will have a much more like a forum type uh, discussion as much as we can so our team is adding that right now uh, the the um our um, alumni in the meantime i will start actually asking the questions so um there is one boring licensing question they they mentioned revet is saying so for developer licensing i noticed that public demonstration is unchecked does this only apply for public displays of the hardware or is any software developer work of limits to show as well? Ah, you're diving into, into the legal world here. Um, from the top of my head, I'm pretty sure that uh, we have retained both the haptics and, and, and the hand tracking, the ability to uh, for, for developers to create something and to, uh, and to demonstrate it. So I think if you're doing it for a non-commercial um, use case, you're not sort of building a product um, and you are uh, trying to show off something that you've created. I don't think that we stop that. I think there are certain thresholds where if you're building a product, then yeah, uh, you just come and talk to us. Um, if that doesn't make sense from looking at the website, then drop me a message on uh, on Twitter and I'll make sure that's sorted out or drop an email to our support. But yeah, we generally, we don't stop people showing off cool things that they're making or prototyping. Okay, uh, perfect. So let's go to very quickly to the other question. How do we get access to the reference design for prototyping an MVP? Um, so just on our website, if you go to ultralink.com, um, click on tracking, and then there's the, uh, actually this is the reference design for the, um, for, the, for the camera that's there. If you're talking about the reference design for, um, for the Qualcomm XR2, uh, then uh, I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, I think you'd have to go to Qualcomm's website and find find the XR2 uh, and, and, and look through there. Um, I have to say, they, they just kind of send us them in the post. So um, I don't know how you get a, a reference design from Qualcomm. Perfect, perfect. So um, very quickly, another question. Uh, can I design and manufacture a real-time product using hand tracking ultra-leap technology? How can we give GDT for precision GDD, GDNT for precision mating parts. And um, so real-time product using hand tracking. Uh, so I guess this is meaning um, that they're using hand tracking to provide some input and then something's being manufactured as we do it, I guess. Or I don't know, maybe real-time 3D as well, but it, since it says product, maybe whoever uh, asked this question, uh, hope, happy to 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 um, accept this uh, person and directly ask to us because we have let's let's skip this for now and um, maybe we can since we have already um, a few members here from the hand tracking masterclass mentors and alumni and instructors so anyone who would like to ask directly to Tom you can raise your hand and uh also i can you can just unmute yourself i know that i you had one question hi yes i do have a question okay. um so the the new ultra leap sensor has a, a much smaller form factor and that's to focus on better integrations with virtual reality headsets in this like next coming generation do you have any um thoughts or predictions about possible future integrations with augmented reality devices. And I'm very curious on that because especially as like uh, 
in terms of like augmented reality devices are probably going to be a lot smaller. Like uh, the the ones that are going to reach mass adoption are probably not going to look like Hololens sized devices. They'll probably be a lot closer to eyeglasses. So. Um, do you have any thoughts as the, the form factor is getting smaller for virtual reality? What do you see in ways of future uh, integrations with augmented reality devices? Yeah, I think I think that's a really great question. Um, I, I and I, th I think you hit the nail on the head there. But I think this uh, this new module will be installed into a lot of VR headsets. You're not going to see it in a huge number of, of AR headsets because um, AR just has more focus on uh size cost power consumption um as you mentioned the the key for us there really you know we'll continue to have sort of like lead the um uh, like design of camera hardware for hand tracking to create like what is the best uh, experience for hand tracking but what we've done with on the software side is that our next generation of hand tracking software is not tied purely to our uh, our camera hardware. So in the past, if you got V1, V2, V3, V4 of our hand tracking software, the only thing it would work on is a leap motion controller. Uh, and now uh, our, our new um, SR170 camera module as well. Um, but the new version of the uh, of the hand tracking software can run on different types of camera hardware um, created by third parties as well. Not every type of camera uh, out there, but more and more over time. That's sort of how we uh, how we built it, how we designed it. Um, in terms of the software, we can get it really, really low uh, onto low compute platforms and, and low power consumption. So the, the the move for AR really will be that um, again the same cameras that are integrated onto the headsets that are used for the six stop tracking uh, for, 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 for the head tracking um, will get the the hand tracking running on the, uh, on those same cameras. Um, so that's that, that that's the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, James Alderley, uh, you had one question, as far as I remember. Um, yeah, hi, Tom. I, I was just, uh, yeah, thanks for speaking today. I, I was just asking um, a little bit along the lines of Ian's question. I, just your thoughts on what, uh, what, what's, what's the necessary field of view size to have a a good hand tracking experience, specifically in that AR space, you know, is is 170 by 170, you know, is that kind of beyond what you'd recommend? Um, you know, how does the field of view size relate to that? What's the what's a good kind of feeling hand interaction experience in terms of the the display field of view too? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, and the uh, the display field of view for me is the is is the key that. Um, Having a field of view for hand tracking that is smaller than the field of view for the display, um, I think gives a bad experience. Uh, it's it's it re it's really jarring to be in a VR and AR experience and be able to use your hands in some places that you can see and not in others. Um, so certainly we'd like it to be at least the same size as the uh, as the visual field of view, but it's actually a lot better if, if the hand tracking has maybe sort of like five to 10 degrees extra field of view each side. Uh, and the main reason for that is that means if your hands are coming into the scene from, uh, from outside, the system picks up the hands and starts tracking them and sees what they're doing before they come into the, uh, into the visible field. And um, it also means that if you're holding something and you, and you kind of look away, uh, there's more chance that even though your hand disappears out of the visual field of view, whatever you're doing is gonna continue happening um, there. So, yeah, generally, I would say get the um, the visible field of view and then add ideally something like 10 degrees to that. Perfect. Uh, it's very nice to see our hand tracking uh, first cohort uh, alumni joining us today. So let's continue. Actually, we have, of course, a little bit um, priority to, to the masterclass students because we want to make sure that they are continuing their learning uh, journey with these uh, open lectures. So uh, one of our mentors, Mark Stillman, I think, Mark, you had one question. Would you like to ask or? Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, uh, I just wanted to follow up with uh, what Ian asked about kind of fitting the hand tracking tech into smaller form factors. 
uh, like AR glasses. I'm wondering if you think it's possible to fit like the haptics part, the ultrasound haptics part as well into like a standalone HMD? And if so, like what are the primary challenges? Because I imagine there's might be, you know, kind of power consumption issues. And yeah, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, that's a really great question. Thanks, Mark. So um, I think the, the, the answer to that at the moment is it's possible, um, but I'm not yet sure it's a good idea. So um, we have smaller form factor hardware coming through um, and we have uh, loads of really interesting and funky experiments we've done in the office. Uh, I'll post the pictures publicly sometimes of, kind of like headsets with arrays strapped to the front of them and people testing things out. Um, the, the first thing I think before we end up like really diving into the, um, the, the, the logistics with the hardware and the power consumption is just how you're going to interact. So if you have the, uh, the haptics embedded into the headset, then the, the force of the feedback is going to be projected forwards. Um, there are some really cool interactions you can do there, sort of holding your hand up and having a sort of a display on your hand, which you can then interact with and, and feel things on but generally it means it's going in the wrong direction for the interactions you're doing with the world around you. And even if you just think of getting to menu items and uh, if you want to press a button and feel it, it's going to feel weird to kind of press it into your face in order to get the, uh, the, the, the haptic response. So um, we, we've explored and experimented in our team at, uh, at building these kind of experiences all the time. We've looked at multi-user use cases where you have people with the haptics integrated into the headset that project the feedback to each other uh, and all of these kind of um, crazy experiences. But at the moment, the best like um, uh, setup over the, you know, certainly 2020 and 2021 is going to be to have the hand tracking in the headset and then the haptics. If it's a, like a location-based entertainment thing where you go around an experience, they're embedded into the walls uh, there. So you kind of go up and do whatever activity you're going to do uh, inside that experience and the haptics is there. Or if you're doing some kind of uh, enterprise application, something like design where you're sat at a desk and you have a module actually on the, uh, on, on the desk in front of you. But yeah, uh, cool question. Thanks. Uh, just, just quickly adding on to that. Uh, do you think that we're going to see like significant uh, improvements in the accessibility, like namely the price point for the the ultrasound haptics? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, there'll be there'll be quite a big shift there, but uh, um, and we're, we're not a million miles away from it, but uh, I'm not going to put a timeline uh, right now. Um, so yeah, keep a watch out and uh, it's coming. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Mark, for these nice questions. Uh, we have to be quick. We have 10 more questions. And uh, Richard, you had one question. Richard is also our mentor from uh, the first hand tracking masterclass. He is the master of gloves as well. So <laughs> very quickly, Richard, uh, nice to see you. Yeah, hi, Tom. Hi, Farhan. Um, so specifically, I'm interested, you guys had a partnership with Pimax and I ordered the hand tracking module about almost two years ago now and still waiting for it. They said that it should be coming next month. So I just wanted to hear your input on what it's like working with Pimax and uh, what to expect when I finally get that, because they've been saying that it's going to be wider field of view, but sounds like it already has wide field of view. So I'm guessing it's probably going to be the same as everything else, 170 degrees. Um, the other thing is the main reason I bought the Pimax uh, with the hand tracking module is I'm interested. I've been working with VR gloves for the past few years for this company, Noitom. Uh, they have the high five VR gloves and those are IMU based uh, gloves. Uh, so what's nice about it is it works anywhere. It doesn't have to be in the field of view of any camera or anything, uh, just the Vive base stations uh, to see the Vive trackers. So pretty much you have, you know, you can have your hands behind you, in front of you, wherever. Um, so I think that's nice, but the problem is since it's IMU based, you don't actually have the optical tracking that something like uh, ultra haptics would give you. So. Uh, I'm interested in trying to combine like the ultra haptics um, with the VR gloves. So I'm wondering if there's been any thought uh, with you guys with doing something like that um, and if there's any interest. Yeah, um, really good question. So uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm not really going to comment too much on Pimax and working relationship there, primarily just because I've not been there for all of that. 
Um, so apologies that you've had to uh, wait so long to, to, to get the module from them, but um, uh, the, the merger uh, only happened last year, so I've not, I've not really been sort of there from the beginning of that, so I, I, I can't really comment on the full story. But what I can tell you is the module you're going to receive has this um, SIR 170, it's our camera module um, embedded in it. So it is going to give you the full 170 by 170 um, degree field of view. Um, and I think that'll match up and be a great experience with the uh, with the Pimax headset and the uh, the wide visual field of view that um, that they have there. On the um, uh, on the co combination with gloves, I think there's always applications to um, to tie to great technologies together um, when there's like a specific benefit of getting those two features. Like like, like you say, uh, there there are things that our hand tracking can't do, and there are things that the uh, the arm gloves can't do. So where there are specific applications that the combination of those two features is really, really important, then, uh, then yeah, absolutely combine them and, and, uh, and make use of it. I think it's one of the exciting things about the whole um, VR space is that you see both the, like the, the mainstream consumer aspect, where I was talking earlier about, I think that really is low friction, low friction, low friction. Uh, even getting somebody to put a headset on is, uh, it is a pretty sizable amount of friction there. Um, but then there are so many applications where like a specific setup or a specific use case gives you so many benefits. So um, um, yeah, we see a number of applications where you combine our technology with other sorts of tracking or other sorts of um, uh, other, other sorts of sensory detection systems and, uh, and create something pretty special. Yeah, because I'm thinking like with the movie Ready Player One, you see them using VR gloves. So thinking, you know, in the future when we want the full immersion and we want the most accurate hand tracking, then maybe some kind of combination might be good. So I was just wondering if you guys have been thinking about that or if you're more focused on kind of more of the present uh, with getting VR in everyone's hands. Yeah, I, I think our, um, our view of the world sort of as it evolves over time, is that the the best hand tracking will be optical and we'll slowly be able to build out our, um, our our functionality to be able to do better hand tracking than you can do with sort of sensors that you put on your hand and also uh, naturally a lot of the ready player one reason they wear gloves is to get the haptics uh, and same as uh, um, we, we, we get the, the minority report um, comparison trotted out a lot and the thing I always say is you know, Tom Cruise wear four gloves he's got those little uh, uh, gloves on, whereas our focus, both of the hand tracking and the haptics, is being able to enable you to to have these experiences without having to put anything on your body. And that's kind of the uh, it's kind of the uh, one of the key um, sort of uh, visions that we have in the company. Is this like, don't wear anything, don't touch anything, but you can still uh, interact and feel what you're doing. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Richard. Um, so. We have really limited time, maybe one more question. I would like to, first of all, um, invite everyone to, the, to next week because next week we will go a little bit deep dive like technically and use case based. So you will have, uh, we, we are now actually um, capturing all these questions uh, and we will make sure that it's being answered. Uh, the other thing is uh, we have, as we are always doing after guest lectures, we have Discord networking event. So in our Discord channel, our team is sharing the Discord invite with you. So um, for those who would like to continue the discussion and one hour, for those who think that one hour is not enough, we will continue there to discuss. Uh, we have one final question, which is, uh, I, I also believe that this is something that everyone is curious about. Um, what is the key advantage to other hand tracking technologies like Oculus hand tracking? So I would like to also invite actually our uh, trainers who are having already a uh, hand tracking uh, background, especially they have uh, an, um, a side quest hand tracking, uh, hand physics lab, Dennis and Roger, the trainers of our uh, hand tracking masterclass. Maybe they may want to add comment or they may add a few uh, a different perspective to this question. Um, so Tom, what, what do you think, like what is the key advantage or what are the different perspectives that 
uh, you as UltraDeep and um, Oculus hand tracking is um, following right now? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I can't speak for the, uh, the, the team at, uh, at Oculus as to what their um, perspective of, of development is. We've taken two slightly different approaches to how we, uh, how, how we build hand tracking. And for us, I think where, um, where I believe our hand tracking gives a better experience is, is some of the, like the key aspects of the experience of using hand tracking that we focus on. So um, one big example is initialization of hands. So when you bring your hand into the scene, how fast does the system recognize that there are hands there and start tracking? That's super, super, super important because um, particularly when you go to, towards consumer products, if you're putting it on people who aren't techie uh, themselves and they hold their hands up and it doesn't work, they can't see the hands uh, and you have to sort of, you know, that sort of um, thing we've learned over uh, over years with earlier, um, earlier uh, implementations of, of, of hand tracking where you kind of have to like give it, give your hand a bit of a shake to get it to detect. Um, that those, those things are, are, are bad. So we focus on that. So initialization, um, and then we do a lot for um, robustness for particularly for multi-hand uh, interactions. So um, being able to actually touch your hands together, um, kind of do this kind of stuff, uh, and have one hand go over the other hand, and, and so the, the camera has uh, one of the hands occluded. Um, we can keep tracking in those uh, in, in those scenarios, um, and, and and those are the things. So yeah, I'd say top of uh, the list in my, in my view anyway is um, making sure when your hands are in the scene they're being tracked whether that's just when they appear or and then making sure they don't disappear when you're doing various interactions with two hands together or um, uh, or, or one including the other uh, and late latency there as well I think is key um, we we worked very hard on getting very very low latency um, uh, hand tracking so you don't just even like like tiny amounts. You, you certain, certainly you go above twenty milliseconds, and and you and you really notice the uh, um, you you notice the latency. You start perceiving your hands. I think I think um, if you looked at the long term trajectory of hand tracking, where does it need to get to? Like what's going to be a great hand tracking user experience in the future? Um, because it's novel now, you still get that sort of like that. There's that coolness and that excitement of being able to use your hands in virtual reality will know that we've succeeded when nobody mentions using their hands. Like your hands are just, you ignore them. Same as touch screens. As soon as they went to uh, that sort of high refresh rate, nobody talks about using a touch screen. It's just the thing that's always there. Um, so, yeah. okay. so actually Jim asked this question, like, is it uh, under 20 milliseconds? Um, uh, the last, your last? Uh, Yes, yeah, so um, it actually gets down low on that. The, the, the latency depends slightly on um, some environmental factors, like uh, how bright it is, and also how fast your hand's moving. Um, but generally, yeah, it's substantially lower than 20 milliseconds, um, often down to sort of around 10 or less. Perfect, perfect. Roger, um, you are mostly, of course, we know that you are mostly uh, developing games and apps at um, Quest. Uh, but I know that you already have different experience with different um, hand tracking uh, technologies. So do you have any question or comment to add? Yeah, like one of the main pain points. So first of all, like the increased field of view is definitely a big welcome for us, like because that's one of the main pain points. But the second uh, area where we have difficulties with the quest tracking is when you go a little bit further away um, from your body. And often when you want to reach something, then you lose tracking. It's just so frustrating because with the controller, it works very nice, right? And the field of view is one thing, but also the distance, not just the degrees um, up and down, left, right, but also the distance, how far you can track something and still be able to manipulate objects. And I was wondering if there is also a big improvement compared to you know, the current standard or what it was before. Yeah, so the, the distance at which you can track is primarily dictated by the hardware. So um, it's how high resolution are the cameras and uh, kind of what's the field of view of the camera. So uh, if you think about it, you're taking the resolution of the camera and spreading it around over the field of view. And ultimately you need a, a certain number of pixels that make up the hand in order to be able to track it. Um, so with our hardware with the new camera module and the, the sort of the unit that we're integrating into, uh, or lots of companies are integrating into their headsets, that has a range of up to a meter that it can track. Uh, and 
one of the main reasons that it was set at a meter is that so far we haven't found anybody who has arms that are longer than a meter. Uh, <laughs> so the idea is that you can hold your arms out as far as you can and move them around. And it yeah. Will. So, yeah. Okay, yeah. that is that is a very exciting news. And uh, what the new the or two like will come out with is that what will be also in the standalone headsets like is are those comparable what will be shipped like in the basically from qualcomm chip is that basically the same quality we can expect yeah so the qualcomm um uh reference design doesn't use our camera hardware um it's sort of an mm -hmm. example you know one of the first maneuvers of um our software being deployed on other camera hardware which is really exciting but the specs of the camera hardware are pretty similar uh they're not exactly the same but in terms of um, field of view and range that you can track that it should be uh, it should, it should be comparable, yeah. That's very exciting. And one question, like um, Oculus has a very limited um, kind of API, you know, to to get data from the hand tracking, like gesture recognition or anything like that. It's basically just a pinch which you have on certain fingers. Um, will that standard design also come with the SDK, which has maybe a little bit more um integrated or will it be basically the raw data because most of the applications you will be basically just use the raw data and then build our frameworks on top and i was wondering if there will be more coming to make the interaction design a little bit more convenient for the majority of developers yeah so any um any developers building experiences without hand tracking whether that's um just with a leap motion controller right through to a headset that feature our hand tracking technology you can use our uh, SDK, you can use our APIs, and that's all there. You can use our tools like the interaction engine, uh, which builds up all of these ways of, of doing really good grab interactions and uh, interacting with objects at a distance, um, which good segue, uh, John's going to be talking a bunch about the sort of insides of how that's built next uh, next week. Um, and uh, and the other thing I'd also mention is OpenXR. They're obviously a part of OpenXR. So um, the idea is that the OpenXR API will evolve and get more fully featured over time. And then if you build any kind of application using the OpenXR API, it can run on uh, Facebook's hand tracking, it can run on our hand tracking, it can run on sort of any headset, so yeah. Yeah, we hope that this is coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, really we are waiting for this, um, the, the fruit of this cooperation with Qualcomm with in other hand uh, headsets, so we can add that directly to our masterclass. This is what we are waiting for. So we will be <laughs> probably one of the first who will start um, uh, announcing the hand tracking and hand interactions in any headset you want. For most of them are already powered by Qualcomm chipset. So it will be great for everyone. Dennis, you have one question before we uh, close? Uh, yes, sorry. Um, hi, Tom. So I had one main question is, uh, what is your take or how do you handle um, the, the tracking confidence when the finger are looking away from the camera? For example, if the, the wrist is in front of the finger, uh, is there a way that you can use the, the arm information to uh, prevent that the hand loses tracking? Because I know that's a big issue on the Oculus tracking. As soon as the finger are not visible, it basically also loses the hand position completely. That was the, of the, one of the main issues I had to deal with for uh, Hand Physics Lab, that it doesn't like completely go glitchy. So is there a way that you can yeah, really use the arm information and maybe more information from the body to not lose the position of the hand? Do you have maybe a system that uses that for um, leap motion hand tracking? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what we, uh, what we do. So we use um, every bit of the, uh, of the hand, the arm, the body that we can see to, uh, to guess or, or, or establish what positions the, uh, the the hands and the fingers will be in so um if you can't see the fingers if they're pointing away from the uh from the camera you can usually see um that, like the arm the hand uh, and then there's usually some kind of little details of the fingers that are visible uh, and our hand tracking will use those little details to figure out where the uh, uh, where the fingers are pointed and um, that gets better with the next version of our hand tracking as well so that's uh, uh, something I'm super excited for, um, for everybody to be able to get their hands on and play with in the, in the not too distant future. Okay, great. Are you also planning to add uh, potentially full body tracking as uh, also Oculus is planning with their body API also to the to your SDK? Um, we don't have plans on releasing something like that at the moment. Um, it's yeah, it's kind of like a, a, a maybe up on the wall, something we could do, like we could start tracking things that are more than hands, but 
right now our focus is on doing a really great job of tracking hands uh, and then getting that out there into um, headsets that are accessible that everybody can get hold of and build great content for. So that's the that's that's the focus. Okay, thanks. Great. So uh, we are a little bit out of time, and uh, but the good news is next week, uh, at least Tom, your team will be with us. So we will go deep dive into three different use cases and principles. Um, I think uh, you, you can also check for those who are interested. Um, please sign up from today. So it will be in your calendar. So I'm looking forward to the next week and lecture. And we will continue. This is, as we mentioned, hand interactions uh, pro event series. So for the last already one week uh, uh, with Roger, Dennis, and with other speakers that we are trying to explore, there are many things to explore. So we will continue about that principles class, master class. And um, thank you, Tom, for being with us. And thank you, everyone, for these great questions. Don't worry, your questions is already being stored and we, we keep it for the next week. So it will be answered. I will already share this with the Ultra Deep team. So next week we will make sure that we have an elaborate answer actually uh, for your questions. And um, hoping to see you in uh, the next week's event and principles class as well. Um, and thank you everyone again and have a very nice week. Bye. Thanks everybody. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Thanks, you. Tom. Discord Thanks, party. Bye.